I'm going to actually do a piece where you might not even want to play keys because I don't know if you could follow this. This is pretty harsh. <laughs> this is, yeah. Um, on the night my best friend Esmeralda was raped, her innocence peeled open like new fruit at midnight on a rooftop in Queens. I was asleep. I did not dream of demons dressed in black, armed to the teeth with reasons. They'd been commanded by God to confiscate the freedoms of my body that, like new fruit, I too would be pulped and bloodied, broken open by the beatings of men that never cared to understand my story or that they, satisfied with the sweetness of my struggle, would mark themselves unwelcome and eternal on the newness of my pages, dear body. The Bible's first reported rape case was a woman named Dinah. She had two brothers, Simeon and Levi, who, upon discovering the brilliance of their sister's build was defiled, conned an entire city into circumcising themselves willingly as dowry for the man who slayed her spirit and crucified the calm of her body, then drew their swords beneath the veil of night and unapologetically murdered every male in the city within a radius of 50 miles. But when the dust settled, their father Jacob still had the nerve to chastise them. He offered no solace to the silhouette of a woman who now somehow resembled his daughter, told his sons the killings were bad business, that his empire stood to be destroyed by the inescapable tidal wave of karma. They replied, Father, would you have us let them treat our sister, your daughter, like a common whore, dear body? Let their spirit drive your breathing onward, dear body. Repulse the ignorance of the rapist and the Nas uncaring father with everything inside you, dear body, always be allied to the women whose ability to choose is taken from them daily and then slaughtered, dear body. I remember you buckling beneath the weight when Esmeralda finally called you. Her voice, a timid tremble, sung in staccato, and you, my physical form, strung expressionless and hollow while she explained that she miscarried 803 miles too far away to feel the flames unfurling in your mouth, the eruption too sudden for your jawbone to house. You cursed God like the only thing capable of standing between Requiem and the one in six women raped statistically would be a deity that were genuinely concerned. Racism and slavery were the original sins of this nation, but rape and curiosity of the unknown are the original sins of mankind. Are the reasons that propelled Eve to succumb and taste her new fruit in the garden are the reasons the seeds of new fruit blossoming beautiful within Esmeralda's belly became martyr. Dear body, you have always been blessed with the privilege of not having to think about it to traverse rooftops, alleyways, and sidewalks at dusk with safety, pinning your smile, dear body, become the metaphysical manifestation of Simeon and Levi. Never allow your empathy to be muffled, nor your empathy to be quieted. Most victims only understand fear and silence. Be the voice they have had stolen. Be Esmeralda's bedside prayers, be her oxygen. Be firm enough to stand up for the frail and forgotten ones, be support be strength. On the night my best friend Esmeralda was raped on a rooftop in Queens, I told her that new fruit must be pruned. And while we could both waste away, consumed of her hurting, I knew she stood only to grow in the end. And now, after pouring over photographs of her newborn son, as pure as the palms of the Lord thy God, caterpillar cocoon proof, he still emerged from her inner darkness, butterfly beautiful. I use new fruit as a metaphor to symbolize newness and healing. And honestly, y'all, if that's the fact of the matter, then aren't we all? She had a halo made of embroidered haiku. Majestic, holy, deeply rooted in kente cloth and a broken, dispossessed native tongue, she speaks Swahili. But only when she feels the sun swell beneath her melanin and make her feel at home. Saijiki, Botswana, and Kigo cradling her tongue says the unclear Bantu ethnologue helps her write her poems. I told her I hated haiku. 
said I felt there is no lazier form of poetry then she replied back laced acid over a shotgun shell my mother tongue is too intangible for a mouth like yours to hold our haiku has high stepped over more decomposing corpses than your eyes have beheld I'll recite one for you said the Congo Basin had its name changed from Zaire when the body snow angel too black told me that death tastes a little heavier when it lingers in the air where you live, that my being born American was a gift to be cherished, that the corpses my country has created and buried were likely rendered lifeless, then cartelled to cemeteries outside my line of sight told me that she's seen countless men slaughtered before her very eyes, that the prayers contained within three lines of African haiku are often more profound than entire three-minute poems of certain spoken word artists. Her words, thickly accented with the lilting of a mother tongue she has been dying to rid herself of. American men accost her, inject smoke into her blood, insult her speaking. I say, I'd love to write you a haiku. She told me to write two. I said, if my back housed wings, I would fly you someplace safe, someplace not like home. Two, I appreciate the light in your haiku poems. I apologize, love. However, I must address your comment about the corpses. See, in this country, our bludgeoned and bloodstained black men are still walking. My haiku would mimic the mindset of a million living martyrs before having their necks snapped by nooses like stalks during harvest. I have always wondered if rope was torn brown to convince us that our genocide was suicide or that their pistols, glinting the empty of so many southern midnights, are so black. When we pray for mercy from the death we never know stands at our door, we still don't question why. Our psalms are swallowed like black holes digesting beams of light. Our haiku sounds like silence, sounds like darkness unfolding itself. Our haiku sounds like deep breaths, steps turned heads, muffled recordings, bang, drop dead, dropped tea cans and skittle bags. Our haiku cannot be held in the everything of these mouths, carrying the genetic traits of plantation runaways with desiccated tongues. My maw has never fastened stiff enough to contain three lines of burial plot, nor 17 syllables of tombstone. We are the same, you and I. We just share two separate halos. And every day I grow older, I grow more hopeful. Mine won't cradle willow like a wayward child, then soil the leaves with my sacrifice. That it will not crown the hollow point designated since birth to swim into the silk of my spine and rip every fragment of tenderness, compassion, love, and loyalty out. I'm hoping you and I both last long enough to be properly eulogized. She was a lover. He was a poet. She was a friend. He was her eyes. They are a mirror framed too beautiful, too boldly, and too black to ever fit between three lines. Your first cousin called me 6.30 Sunday morning the moment she heard you were hit. Crying the funeral tears of a woman battered by the bloodletting of her closest kin. She asks me how to write about death. While the stench of rotting flesh still bubbles beneath the barrier of her doorway. When the mortality of her family strikes so close to home, eight of the blows actually connect. I tell her that I have no clue that I would be lying, trying to give an honest answer when my question is the same, that I, an innocent black man living in a country that presupposes I'm racist, simply for loving my own people, would never be afforded the luxury of assuming such things in this place, much less compile enough content to chronicle and keep. Death is something I see in the eyes of those of us still living, that every day I claim life my body is little more than a monastery for the menagerie of deconstructed spirits, that my decomposition would be depicted as normal, 
that every breath I draw makes me one step closer to becoming contaminated soil, excavated by officers who have already encoffined our people lifetimes before. I remember we used to sick dogs and hose you all down with frozen water. No wonder generations later your descendants can't swim. No surprise, I let my bullets glide butterfly swift. Do all of the backstroking in Walter Scott's life for him. Watch them breaststroke into his chest cavity from behind, fragment and flare inside him with the hatred of a Ku Klux manhunt, then tear and spill everything magic in him out from the front. These holes, cavernous as the Atlantic Ocean. What an incredible sight to behold. Another black man concretized in a chalk outline for the media to mock. Far be it from me to offer CPR for your wheezing lungs. Your non-lethal force is nothing but an inside joke. Why tase you when I could erase you? We have been trying to rid this world of your color since the beginning. No matter this world bears the name Earth, the same earth that shares its ancestry with your skin. No matter you ruled this world before, Nagus and Queens. I see King Musa in your men. I point infrared beams. I see Queen Candace in your women. I will black market backyard abortion clinic inoculate everything. My predecessors trained me to believe that black babies are the most combustible beings, that their parents are the despondent remnants of leg irons and chains. The incinerated friction of black skin and a backhand whiplash is a full metal jacket hollow point shell in 2016. I will paint the oceans brown body blood stained red, paint the shoreline funeral regalia black, and paint the earth pastel like the peach in my skin. Make your melanin irrelevant. Your four kids, the reason you live for mourners, your big rims seem like probable cause. Make your life a smear on the windshield of a worthy white man's Porsche. I mean, let's be honest. We never really gave a fuck about your bins anyway. Never cared that you successfully circumnavigated the unrest of this racist world we live in for an excess of 50 years. Never cared that you were about to be married. Mike Slager. I will pray for you tonight on bended knee. The Lord offers you forgiveness. Then in the same breath, pray you spend the rest of your life taking shots from behind in prison. To the family of Walter Scott and to my good friend Mika, I love you with all of the light that my creator put in me. Your loss is the hymnal that my heart has been singing. And I can only imagine that you, like I, are far too tired of writing eulogies. This is gonna this is this is gonna start off and you're gonna think it's a love poem, but it's not. So bear with me for about 60 seconds, all right? Most days, no matter how much of a gentleman I am. If the machinations of my mind were to manifest themselves in reality, it would be tragic how immediately and entirely they would betray my character. On the surface, first date, my queen, it has been the most unparalleled of pleasures meeting you. Your skin smells of lilac. Your lips are a masterpiece that curve more delicious than anything but the dips of your hourglass waist, your hair holds the fragrance of my next 50 years. There is no GPS accurate enough to keep a man this weak from being lost in the light of your eyes. They carry the same scintillating glow as the archangels. My life's every dream realized would be holding you in my arms until you and I wither slowly into gentle bones, laid to rest right beside one another like no tribulation or trial of this world would keep us from tongue kissing our way into the afterlife hands melting together with firm grip fingers interlocking like our life stories our golden heartbeats synchronizing into concerto the theme music that will play us out as we transcend into our final glory fully whole fully satisfied and fully joined However, 
up here in my mind. I'm doing all that I can to keep myself from saying out loud just how badly I keep wondering what your pussy feels like. I mean, to be honest, I could apologize in advance for being so impolite, but truthfully, I do not give a fuck. You look like you would be fun to argue with on purpose. Just so I could grab you by your throat and then offer you an attitude adjustment that'll leave your conscience clear as day, but the lower half of your body walking funny. I am a sex addict. I will not feel ashamed for willing to be baptized in the waterfall cascading from your thighs at least five times per day. That's 35 per week. I might be the right one to love you, but I am the wrong one for you to play with. I'm a freak. Don't let this smooth vernacular make a fool out of you. Trust me, if you try me and forget about the fact that there are levels, I will make your pussy throb over and over until you come to your senses. Now, what I mean by this is, if you brush me wrong on your way out the door trying to be flirtatious, that gentle stroke of a shoulder may force daddy to touch you back. You leave your perfume embedded in the thread of my shirt and its scent reminds me of heaven. I will feel every inch of the goddess in your thighs while I put you on my face. I'm not sure what you heard, but if you part your legs and offer me a taste, I will make your eyes roll so far into the back of your skull that your own thoughts will be the only thing you see. I am the man of your dreams with a mean streak. I didn't make any plans for Valentine's Day. I have only ever been known for making more edible arrangements. This means I've got my mind made up to run my stick through your passion fruit on sight. Let the juice spill out and then taste it. So I make the call like, hey, baby. Have you ever wondered what it's like? I mean, I know you and I met not too long ago, but would it be all right if I made you scream while I lick whipped cream off everything inside you? Or, or am I being too straightforward? I mean, I don't want you to think I'm some freak or feel like you're some whore, but that's exactly what I want you to be for me and me only. So come to the address I'm about to send, then take off all your clothing. The lingerie is for sex appeal, but those extra layers are unwelcome here. This electricity between us is not battery operated. This is sympathetic resonance. The wavelength of our vibrations harmonizing on an identical frequency the moment we met. So when I stare into your eyes and your pussy gets wet, or my dick becomes a heartbeat fighting to pulse its way out of my jeans, that's just normal. But I don't want you to think I'm with that love making shit right now, sweetheart, I'm just horny. It's true, we're both mammals, but you and I are completely different animals. You are probably thinking of kissing and touching. I am far more interested in hardcore, bare bones, balls slammed up against your inner thighs, drum and bass, dick buried, center of the earth deep inside you, pure, sweet, hot, pink all-star pussy fucking the differences between a man and a woman are often quite clear you get up close smell my cologne in the corner of my chest and say something like damn daddy you smell incredible what is this and i'll probably respond with something modest like well that's just some new deodorant i'm trying now while your mind is focused on how a man who smells this good may be the future father of your children the look in my eyes is where our speed switch See, I said it's just deodorant because months from this moment, our code word will be speed stick. Whenever you get a 15 minute break on your job and you call me cause you need dick, I'll take you to the conference room, lock the door, then close the blinds so none of your coworkers see shit. Then smack that ass a hundred times in 60 seconds. Shit look like the weave itch. And I hate, and I, <laughs> <laughs> now, now, 
While your mind is focused on how a man who smells as good may just be the future father of your children, the look in my eyes is where our speed switch. See, I said it's just deodorant because months from this moment, our cold word will be speed stick. Whenever you get a 15 minute break on your job and you call me cause you need dick, I'll take you to the conference room, lock the door, then close the blinds so none of your coworkers see shit, then smack that ass a hundred times in 60 seconds. Shit look like the weave itch. And I'd hate to be the man to look you in your face and say that I would never want to control you. Then grab you by your hair, anchor you to the bed, and give you hours of hard dick until I stick to your ribs like soul food. Put you in my mouth and just keep you there. But when you cry out, I will not console you. My job is to suck and swallow your clit until the nerves are firing so hot every inch of your body yearns for escape. But I will force you still, then work my tongue nonstop like I am after overtime pay. I won't apologize for wanting you to stay here until you leave your cum filling anywhere my jaw has space. You are delicious. Why would I let you waste your juices on the sheets when they are such a delicacy? I am a grown ass man. I have swallowed many things. But I haven't experienced a flavor more sumptuous than yours ever. See, I don't want you to scream. I will flick my tongue until you sing the war cry of your ancestors. I want Asada Shakur's message to manifest itself in your orgasms. Defiant and dangerous. Push my head while I eat you from the back. Until you understand how strong this neck is, I am a professional pleasure perpetuator, a perfectionist. I will make myself personally responsible for the quaking in your thighs that hardly last the length of a dying breath, but, but happens so often throughout the day, you cannot help but be reminded of what I did. You will think that this is heaven. But there is nothing but the devil in me when it feels so right that we have both forgotten we are sinning. You will go through hell tomorrow. But right now, I just want to milk every inch of my manhood in your body. And I know that I might be condemned to damnation and hellfire for these carnal thoughts. I mean... Who would I be if not for myself? Women want a gentleman, but if you're sexy enough, you can't even ask me simple questions like what kind of time you got? Because in my mind, I am already spinning you counterclockwise, then running both my hands up and down your slit like 12.30 on the dot. I am a man that knows what he wants and knows how to get it. I won't ask you out for drinks. I am asking you over. Why bother wasting time and money getting tipsy when I will fuck you like I am drunk while I am stone cold sober? Why bother watching your mouth gently massage the rim of a cocktail glass when I would rather taste that which makes me lose every ounce of my focus, both sets? Tevin Campbell wanted to talk for a minute. I want us to have sex. Let me be clear. The queen in you speaks to the king in me, but your body was aligned by the same goddess that designed this blessed planet. Do not be surprised if I sexualize or objectify your flesh. I want to hear you monologue about your desires and your passions just as bad as I want to bend you over while I spread her out for a kiss. And that is the mark of a real motherfucking man. One who knows how to take care of you in every way possible. One with a promise for the future to raise sons that worship women just as I do. But right now, you have the look of the woman I want to leave my future sons inside of. Or at least let you babysit the kids before they all come spilling out. But I know it's wildly different to hear a man look you in your eyes and say they are deeper than Atlantis than a man who considers your stress his dessert, that wants you to melt inside of, then run out the corners of his mouth like Godiva and black cherries. So if my thoughts are too impure, if you and I never grace the iris of one another beyond this precious, majestic night forward, do me a favor. Baby, please say a prayer for my salvation from all of these carnal thoughts. Well, well, thank you for coming out to uh, into the sessions. <laughs>